Hello everyone, today I'm going to introduce you to a TV series that's a mix of horror and thriller called Death's Game. If you're one of the heroes who follow me, let me know by putting this emoji in a comment. The story starts with a university student named Choi, who was about to graduate. His hard work throughout his academic journey had finally paid off when he got an interview call from the teen group. During a conversation with his girlfriend, Drew, he confidently talked as if he had already secured the job. However, an unexpected event was about to change his life forever. While crossing a road, a middle-aged man bumped into him and fell into the path of an oncoming vehicle. The man was hit by the vehicle, thrown into the air, and landed in a pool of blood. People around were commenting on the incident, but no one dared to help. Only Choi rushed to the man's aid, but it was too late for any last words. The man coughed up blood and passed away, gripping Choi's arm tightly in his last moments. After freeing himself from the grip, Choi was left shaken. His fear followed him into the interview room where he sat, haunted by the incident, unable to focus on the interviewer's questions. The interview ended disastrously. From that day on, Choi seemed to be on a path of misfortune. He set out hundreds of resumes, but all these interviews ended in rejection. Facing an uncertain future, Choi tried to reassure himself that things would improve. However, the harsh reality of life spared no one. The debt from his university days and the living expenses were overwhelming, and he couldn't even catch his breath before finding a stable job. Choi took up various odd jobs. He worked as a bartender, a hired driver, and did whatever was necessary. Then the COVID pandemic hit, making the job search even more difficult. Before he knew it, Choi had been out of college for seven years. His peers had all achieved success in their careers and families, moving forward without any pause. Choi, however, seemed stuck, his life unchanged. But he remained committed to his original goals. On this particular day, Choi finally made it to the final round of interviews at Time Group. Among the interviewers was Park, the eldest son and CEO of the group. Despite his lack of significant work experience, Choi performed well. Park admired Choi's hardworking and disciplined nature. His words of praise gave Choi a boost of confidence, making him feel certain of his success. But his happiness was short-lived. He received a call informing him that the money he had lent to a friend for stock investment was all gone. When Choi reached his friend's house, a friend had already run away. In despair, Choi banged on the door in frustration. The neighbors, disturbed by the noise and thinking he was crazy, called the police. Choi explained the situation to the police, hoping they could find his friend. But the officer's words left him cold. He was told that investment always involves risks and if he lost money, he had to accept it as bad luck. Having caused a disturbance, Choi ended up with a police record and the job opportunity he had been hoping for was completely lost. Heartbroken, Choi sought comfort from his girlfriend only to see her outside her apartment building receiving flowers from a wealthy man smiling brightly. It seemed as if fate had not just closed a door, but all windows on him. After a series of setbacks, Choi was left without any fight, sighing in resignation. When Choi confronted Ju, she could only muster a weak explanation, insisting she had no connection with the man. However, Choi didn't buy her story, arguing that a wealthy man wouldn't be gifting flowers without a reason. Without any further defense, Ju handed Choi an envelope presumably filled with money for living expenses. Under normal circumstances, Choi might have accepted it reluctantly but his pride wouldn't let him at that moment. Ju was oblivious to the trials Choi had faced that day, even criticizing him for his lack of effort in questioning when he would halt his downward spiral. Choi's efforts appeared to be fruitless. He gave the envelope back to Ju, and they officially ended their relationship that night. But Choi's streak of misfortune was far from over. When he returned to his rooftop apartment in the heavy rain, he discovered his belongings tossed out of the door locked. He was behind on rent and the landlord had demanded he vacate by dawn. It felt as if the world was demanding too much for him to handle. After a rainy night, Don finally arrived, bringing an end to the downpour. Choi checked his cell phone to find the interview result from Tong Group. As anticipated, he'd have failed yet again. His resume, drenched by the rain, was a reflection of Choi's life no longer able to stand on its own. That night, Choi found himself standing in despair on the edge of a tall building. Opposite him, an electronic screen displayed his university's top employment rate, a sight that pierced Choi's heart. The traffic below flowed endlessly. The city was lit up, but Choi's existence wouldn't make any difference to the world. He couldn't comprehend the purpose of life and he no longer had the strength to continue. However, even when facing death, he felt no fear. Before taking his own life, Choi left a suicide note behind. He wrote that death was merely a humble way to end his suffering. He wasn't afraid of something as insignificant as death. Finally, Choi took the plunge, diving into the abyss. Surrounded by darkness, Choi thought he had ended up in hell. But when he opened his eyes, he found himself seated in a luxurious airplane. Full of questions, Choi was stunned to realize he had assumed someone else's appearance. 
Inside the cabin was an attractive woman wearing sunglasses. After reading it, she burned Choi's suicide note, and the woman removed her sunglasses, revealing a pair of red eyes. After a few seconds of eye contact, the woman transported Choi to a scorched lamb surrounded by a sea of blood. The place was enveloped in dark clouds and thunder, resembling the underworld. Choi had returned to his original appearance, and the roars of monsters echoed around him. It turns out the woman was a manifestation of death, the only immortal being in this world. Choi's suicide note was filled with scorn and insult towards death. As a result, the Grim Reaper felt humiliated and decided to punish him in anger. After revealing this, she tossed Choi into the sea of diabetic blood, and he was instantly swarmed by numerous diabetic creatures. Inside, Choi woke up abruptly on the plane. The attractive Grim Reaper informed him that each person can only die once. As a punishment, Choi was to experience the taste of death twelve times. His soul would enter the bodies of twelve people on the verge of death, and after experiencing their final moments, Choi would descend into hell. In the end, if he could somehow prevent these deaths from happening, he could use their bodies to live out the rest of his life. With a flick of its fingers, the Grim Reaper transformed into a cloud of dark smoke and disappeared without leaving any traces of her hormones. At that moment, the plane ran into a thunderstorm. Choi was certain a crash was inevitable, so he anxiously prepared for an emergency. A flight attendant tried to calm him down, explaining that this was a normal occurrence and would pass soon. Despite her reassurances, Choi refused to remove his life jacket. Eventually, the storm passed and Choi awkwardly apologized to the attendant, confessing he was easily scared. Moving to the cabin next door, Choi got to experience the lifestyle of the rich for the first time with expensive wine and luxury watches that he could never afford in his entire life. He wondered about the identity of the real owner of the body. Suddenly, a clear crystal entered Choi's brain, endowing him with the original owner's memories and abilities. It turns out the person was the younger brother of Park, the second son of Tan Group. For the brother, the only goal in life was to compete with Park and win the vast family inheritance. Park's brother was indeed a suitable successor, surpassing Park in every aspect since their childhood. As a result, his father had already decided to make him his successor. Currently, Park's brother was also undergoing training to become a representative director. Choi, who was once poor, had transformed into a wealthy and influential figure overnight. Moreover, Tan Group had always been the company Choi dreamed of. Rising to the top in one step was thrilling. While Choi was basking in his newfound happiness, a sudden loud noise came from outside the cabin. The engine had blown up. The plane started spiraling out of control. The pilot tried his best to control the situation, but it was hopeless. Pieces of metal ripped a large hole in the fuselage, and the strong air current instantly sucked out the pilot. The flight attendant desperately held onto the table handle and Choi tried to grab her heavy body, but it was in vain. Despite her heavy body weight, she was easily swept away by the current. Flames spread throughout the plane, eventually engulfing Choi. His time as a wealthy man had come to a sudden end, screaming in a chicken voice. Choi woke up in the Grim Reaper's office. The woman asked him how it felt to die again. Despite being scared out of his wet pants, Choi tried to act brave and said it's not a big deal. Choi knew nothing of the real hell until the Grim Reaper gave him a first-hand experience. For Choi's almost tearful expression, one could tell that the real hell was far more terrifying than the human world. With the echo of a gunshot, Choi found himself in a new body. The original owner of this body was a sports athlete who was attracted to the most dangerous sports and held four world records at a young age. His current challenge was to jump from a height of 8,000 meters without a parachute and land safely in a net. If he succeeded, he would receive a grand prize of 3 billion from sponsors. The event was being live-streamed by several media outlets. People from all corners of the world could witness this extraordinary feat. The viewership on the streaming platform broke all previous records. Seeing the viewer count skyrocket, both the bosses and employees were filled with enthusiasm. At first, Choi was a little scared, but he thought to himself, if this guy is brave enough to take the challenge, he must be skilled. This thought gave Choi confidence. After a short period of adjustment, he was able to skillfully use the athlete's abilities. Having confirmed the location of the net, he headed straight for it. His determination echoed in his heart. He was resolved to succeed and claim the three billion to start a new life. At this moment, the viewership reached its peak with everyone witnessing the moment of a miracle. But as expected, accidents are inevitable. With a loud crash, Choi successfully landed not in the safety net but had a close encounter with Earth. The audience watching the screen was shocked by the accident. After the sports athlete tragically died from a high-altitude fall, Choi met the Grim Reaper once again. And with another gunshot, Choi was reborn for the third time. This time, his soul took over the body of a high school student named Huck. Huck was 17 years old. He lost his father at the age of five and lived with his mother who worked day and night to raise him. 
Keck wanted to study hard to repay his mother's sacrifices, but at school, he became a victim of bullying. The school bully not only took his money, but also recorded his miserable state on phones for amusement. Not wanting to worry his mother, the sensible Huck kept silent. The hellish school life plunged his spirit into turmoil. In his eyes, the bullies turned into terrifying demons. One day, Huck couldn't take it anymore and warned the school bully that if he was bullied again, he would jump from the building. However, his warning didn't deter the bully who slapped him and insulted him scornfully, saying nobody would care if he died. After a round of beating, the bully left triumphantly. Desperate, Huck put his suicide note into his workbook, deciding to end his life. Meanwhile, the bully laughed at a video of the sports athlete's death, snorting in amusement and questioning how there could be such idiots in the world. Hearing this, Troll wanted to slap him, but after gaining Huck's memories, he withdrew his hand, realizing he had become the victim of school bullying. Troy's head dropped in despair that it seemed he thought of something. His appearance could prevent Huck's death. He believed that he could prevent Huck's suicide this time. Compared to the previous two deaths, with this thought, Choi couldn't help but smile. However, his happiness was short-lived as the bully returned to stir up trouble, demanding strawberry milk and threatening to beat Huck if he didn't deliver it before school ended. To the bully's surprise, the Huck standing before him seemed like a different person. He picked up a chair and slammed it against the bully, followed by several powerful kicks. Confronting a group of unruly kids, Choi was naturally fearless. The bully was defeated, but he refused to apologize. Just as Choi was about to teach him a lesson with his fists, the bully's accomplice stepped in to show off his tall and muscular figure. Trapped in Huck's weak body, Choi couldn't fully utilize his strength and was unable to defeat the opponent. The school bully, feeling humiliated, beat up Huck in front of the other students. Still not satisfied, he dragged Huck to the gym after school to continue the beating. Worried that it might lead to a fatality, the tall guy advised the bully to stop, which only made him angrier. Even the tall guy received a harsh slap, just then, the girl the bully liked found them and urged him to leave quickly. Thus, the bullying episode against Q came to an end. Of course, the girl wasn't truly trying to help him. Following Huck's memories, Choi arrived at his home. He looked at the photo of the mother and son together and the note on the fridge that reminded Huck to eat on time. Choi was engulfed in his own memories. Like Huck, Choi grew up in a single-parent family with his mother, a cleaner, raising him on a modest salary. Choi and the thought that after graduating, he would find a job, marry, have children, and lead an ordinary life. However, even this simple goal was unattainable for him. Afterward, Huck's mother returned from work and, as usual, made her son's favorite dishes, including a piece of his beloved roast beef that she put in his bowl. This scene touched Choi's heart. There was a time when his own mother did the same. Every day after school, he would come home to a table full of delicious food, with his mother always nagging him to take more. During the time he was away, he wondered how his mother had been doing. Before he jumped from the high-rise, Choi's mother had called him, but in his eagerness for death, he missed the call forever. Thinking of this, Hup couldn't help but dial his mother's number, hesitating whether to call her or not. The bully sent a text message suddenly, demanding that Hup bring 50000 as protection money the next day. Before, Hup would come up with various excuses to swindle money from his mother. Choi, of course, would not do that. Facing bullying, he decided to stand up bravely. He clearly couldn't do it alone, but Choi quickly realized that the tall guy might be the key to a breakthrough. So seizing the opportunity to go to the restroom, Choi struck up a conversation with the tall guy. He asked him why he was willing to be a sidekick to the bully when he was obviously stronger and why he didn't fight back when beaten and humiliated. He reminded him that the strong should be the ones leading. His words hurt the tall guy's pride and just as he was about to tell Choi the truth, the school bully walked in, causing the tall guy to swallow back down what he wanted to say. The bully asked them what they were doing there. The tall guy quickly made up an excuse to get past the moment. Fortunately, Choi's plan to drive a wedge seemed to be working. When the two reached the turn in the staircase, the tall guy, unable to contain his pride, blurted out that he could beat the bully even with one hand in his pocket. But such a fair fight would never happen. If one messes with the bully, his backer will surely get involved. His backer is a big brute with a very tough background, the best fighter in the area. That's why the bully acts so arrogant in school. Knowing the truth, Choi quickly thought of a strategy. At lunchtime, the bully who had received his money predictably came looking for trouble. Just as he was turning to leave, Choi let out a sudden roar, capturing the attention of everyone in the cafeteria. He marched up to the bully and dumped his leftover cold noodles all over his head, topping it off by placing the bowl on top like a cherry. The bully's face was a picture of humiliation. The bully, seething with anger, ordered the tall guy to seize Huck immediately. To his astonishment, the tall guy remained still, not moving an inch. He not only refused to go himself, but he also prevented his minions who were eager to intervene. The bully was left dumbfounded on the spot. 
The tall guy advised him to stop the nonsense, take a shower, and change his clothes. When he said this, the students who were watching burst into laughter. It turns out that Choi had already struck a deal with the tall guy before executing his plan. No matter what he did to the bully, the tall guy would stay out of it. The humiliated bully found the big brute and asked him to take revenge on his behalf. So leading a group of followers, the big brute stormed into the teaching building. Having gotten wind of this, the tall guy advised Choi to hide so as not to involve him in it. At that moment, Choi was calmly reading a comic book. He reassured the tall guy not to worry, assuring him that everything was going according to plan. Upon reaching the classroom, the big brute thought the tall guy was the one who had bullied the bully. However, the bully pointed out skinny Choi instead. With wide eyes and an innocent expression, Choi looked at the big brute, creating an awkward situation. The big brute was speechless, looking at the bully in disbelief, unable to accept that he couldn't even handle such a weakling. Even the sidekicks didn't believe their boss's ridiculous nonsense. They had expected to confront some muscle-bound hunk, but it turned out to be just a skinny chicken. Bullying the weak isn't a noble act, and if word got out, it would damage their reputation. So feeling embarrassed, the big brute and his sidekicks left with their tails between their legs. Before leaving, he warned the bully to never admit to knowing him outside of school. Huck might be oblivious, but Choi knew well that people like the big brute care about their image above all else. Anything that doesn't enhance their image will eventually be discarded. Without engaging in a fight, Choi managed to make the bully lose his support. After being mocked by Choi, the bully attempted to get physical but was easily pushed away by the tall guy. From that point on, the tall guy rose to prominence and the bully was abandoned by his former crew, becoming a total outcast. As for the bully's girlfriend, attracted to strength, she quickly threw her heavy body into the arms of the tall guy. Having neutralized the bully as a threat, Choi breathed a sigh of relief. Now all he wanted was to work out, build some muscle, and continue living in Huck's body. With nine lives still remaining, it was clear that things were not going to go as smoothly as expected. During a break, a drunken bully came looking for Choi, blaming him for his own downfall. Choi couldn't be bothered with him, and after cursing the bully as a loser, he prepared to head home. While crossing an intersection, Choi didn't pay enough attention to the road and nearly got hit head-on by a speeding truck. Fortunately, it was a close call with no harm done. As he watched the truck drive away, a figure was stealthily approaching. By the time Choi realized, it was too late. The school bully, armed with a brick, struck Choi on the head, causing it to bleed profusely, then continued to hit him with the brick. And so Choi and Huck's body died again. When he regained consciousness, holding his head, he started complaining to the Grim Reaper about the frailty of a high schooler's body and how a few bricks could end him. He even criticized the bully for being so cruel to others, getting angry and wanting to kill someone just because he had a taste of his own medicine. Choi suspected that the Grim Reaper might be meddling deliberately, wanting to see him suffer. Hearing this accusation, the Grim Reaper threw him out, warning him to watch his smelly tongue and words or he won't get another chance at rebirth. After the familiar sound of a gunshot, Choi was greeted with a new life. This time, he became a captive. A gang leader questioned Choi about the whereabouts of a woman and some money. Choi, still not having retrieved his memories, was confused. Observing his lack of cooperation, one of the henchmen produced a bottle opener, intending to gouge on his eyeballs. Just in time, Choi shouted that he would reveal everything but requested a bit more time to recall. Just as the leader was losing patience and picking up a hammer to jog Choi's memory, a memory crystal descended from the sky. It turns out this individual is a hitman who is part of a large and enigmatic gang organization with clients worldwide. Once they accept a mission, they resolve any issue for the client. Despite living a life on the edge filled with danger, the hitman had always managed with ease. That is until he laid eyes on a beautiful woman and was deeply attracted to her or more accurately, her body. The issue was that this woman was none other than the gang boss's lady. It's a cardinal sin to lay hands on his boss's woman, but the hitman was blinded by love and couldn't resist the temptation. Seeing his beloved woman battered and pleading pitifully for the hitman to rescue her from this hell, he found it hard to refuse. So he stole the boss's hidden ten billion in savings and decided to elope with this woman. However, during their escape, they were discovered. The hitman was captured by the boss's followers, but the whereabouts of the woman and the money remained unknown. After regaining the memory, Choi used his assassin skills to escape from the chair. Faced with a group of thugs, Choi could only fight alone bare-handed. Outnumbered by their numbers, he was on the brink of defeat when he grabbed a dagger from nearby and turned off the lights. In the darkness, Troy wreaked havoc, swiftly eliminating all enemies like cutting pieces of meat. While the thrill was undeniable, Choi quickly realized that assassins like the hitman with too many enemies could die at any moment. He thought it was not worth wasting time on him, but the Reaper had warned him that during the punishment process, Choi could not end his own life or he would suffer more than in hell. Embracing his destiny, 
Choi decided to locate the hidden 10 billion first, and he might as well enjoy the money while he had the chance. Upon opening the door, he found himself in a moving truck. He then hopped on a motorcycle and sped onto the highway. After the small mob leader woke up, he immediately reported the situation to his boss. The gang boss issued a 2 billion bounty, rallying all his gangsters. As the motorcycle approached the bridge crossing the river, the pursuers caught up. Confronting bullets, Choi evaded them with his excellent riding skills and initiated his fast and furious game of hide and seek. After narrowly escaping an exploding vehicle, Choi was chased by a motorcycle gang. In a tense battle to evade the gangsters, he drove his motorcycle straight into a shopping mall and rushed into the elevator as its doors opened. Reaching the rooftop and before he could catch his breath, the enemies arrived. The gang boss, in a fury, demanded he surrender. But surrender was never an option. Death was inevitable either way, so Choi performed a spectacular drift, flying off with his motorcycle. Miraculously, he landed safely in a swimming pool in a neighboring building. His phone, fallen into the water, lost its positioning signal. After changing into fresh clothes, Choi stylishly left the hotel. His intuition told him he might just make it this time. At the dock, his beloved woman had been waiting for a long time. She cried like a giant baby, saying she thought he wouldn't come and she didn't know what she would do without him and his muscles. She then asked him where the money was hidden. Choi pointed to a broken Tesla boat on the opposite bank illuminated in the dark. As he dreamt of their future life together, the woman suddenly shot him in the head. It goes with an old saying that the prettier the woman, the more deceptive she could be. His sincere love was wasted, for the woman had always been after the money and took advantage of him. Returning to the Hell Transit, Choi was not saddened by the woman's betrayal. But a place hiding the 10 billion could only be reached by boat, a location only he knew. With the man's death, the woman had lost both man and money. Choi decided that as soon as his new life started, he would immediately go after the cash. However, seeing Choi's smirk, the Reaper likely guessed his intentions. Then a gunshot sounded and a new cycle began. In his latest reincarnation, Choi became a prisoner, locked up in jail, wondering how he could possibly claim the 10 billion waiting outside. Luckily, he learned from a fellow inmate that he would be released in just four days. Among his prison mates, there was one peculiar individual with psychological issues evident from the strange drawings on the wall. Cho was warned by the younger inmates to endure and avoid any conflict with this unstable person at all costs. Cho had yet to regain his memories and was confused about everything around him. When he finally got a clear look at the face of the psychopath, he was shocked. This was actually the school bully who had killed Huck with a brick in the past. What a twisted fate. Remembering his previous encounters, Choi, filled with anger, didn't hesitate to be up the bully. His fellow inmates urgently stopped him, advising him against impulsive actions, warning that it could lead to his demise. As the two stood there staring each other down, the memory crystal finally appeared. The man's name was Sang. His dream was to become a martial arts master, but because of his family's poverty, he had to give up. The money for his martial arts training was borrowed, and when he couldn't repay it, the lender violently demanded it from Sang's mother. Just as mother and son faced dire straits, a lawyer approached him. The lawyer represented a tycoon who had driven drunk and seriously injured a girl before fleeing the scene. If Sang agreed to take the blame for the tycoon, he would be compensated with 200 million. At that time, Sang was only 18 and not yet of age. According to law, he would only receive a suspended sentence and would be released soon. In order to alleviate his family's financial difficulties, Sang agreed. He surrendered himself at the police station, but things didn't proceed as expected. During a trial, the injured girl succumbed to her severe injuries and Sang's initial suspended sentence was converted into a two-year prison term. Sang wished to speak with the tycoon, but such a high-profile individual wouldn't visit a place like a prison. When Sang met with the tycoon's lawyer, he argued that with the increased severity of the criminal law, the compensation should naturally increase. As a result, Sang demanded one billion from the tycoon, threatening to expose how the law was twisted and a minor was made to take the blame once he was released. But the lawyer's response was indifferent. If Sang wanted to stir up trouble after his release, they would ensure he never got out. After retrieving his memories, Choi confronted the school bully who had a fierce, intimidating presence that kept other inmates at a distance. But Choi knew the truth as clear as day. The bully strutted around school with confidence because he had someone to back him up. Without that support, he was nothing. As soon as the bully entered prison, he established his persona by claiming he had killed someone and that he couldn't forget the taste of blood, asking others how they wished to die. His words silenced everyone except for Choi, who couldn't help but laugh at the act. Choi had his fellow cellmate keep watch at the door, signaling if guards were approaching. Then he slapped the bully multiple times. The bully, who could only utter threats, didn't dare retaliate and soon completely lost his composure, dropping the act. 
When the name Huck slipped out during a conversation with Sang, the bully froze, wondering how Choi knew the classmate he had killed. Subsequently, Choi shared the bully's wrongdoings with the other inmates. They were already disgruntled about being deceived, and the bully's mistreatment of the weak only amplified their contempt. So they united and gave the bully a sound beating. As a result, the school bully once again became a pariah in prison. While everyone else was eating, he could only sit isolated in a corner. Someone threw him a salted fish and instructed him to swallow it, bones and all. Under the watchful eyes of the others, the bully didn't dare to disobey. Later, in the labor workshop, while everyone was engrossed in their work, an unattractive man coverly loosened the screws on the circular saw, intending to cause an accident with Choi as the target. The blade flew out, but Choi wasn't the one injured. The guards swiftly removed the injured person, and while Choi was concerned about his fellow inmate, the other prisoners coldly advised him to worry about himself. It turns out the tycoon had bribed them all. Seeing the unfavorable turn of events, a fellow cellmate made a run for it. Without wasting words, Choi fought fiercely with Sang's exceptional combat skills. He landed punch after punch and with a leap he kicked one assailant away. Though outnumbered, the attackers couldn't withstand his strength. Soon, Choi took them all down. He was quite satisfied with Sang's capable body he had possessed. Then the fellow cellmate who had run away returned with a shovel to help, only to find the battle was already over. He could hardly believe his eyes. Later, the two sat on the exercise yard chatting. The fellow cellmate was anxious with his release imminent. He worried about not getting a second chance in society. If he got another opportunity, he vowed not to make the same mistakes. Listening to the fellow cellmate's sincere words, Choi was also moved. He had already been given five chances to start over. If he had known this was how things would end, he would never have impulsively jumped off the building that night. Choi comforted him, saying it's still not too late for him to make a change. On the eve of his release, while the rest of the inmates were asleep, the school bully suddenly sat upright. With a vacant stare fixed on Choi, it was evident he was plotting something. Holding a grudge after failing to defeat Choi in a fair fight and resorting to underhanded tactics, instead, he had sharpened the handle of a toothbrush to a lethal point, waiting for an opportunity to strike Choi down. However, his plan hit a humiliating roadblock when Choi caught him in the act. The bully had already been outsmarted once and now his second attempt was foiled. Choi was angry enough to want to kill the rascal, but he quickly regained his composure. He taunted the bully by asking if his slaps hurt him more than those from the tall guy. At this, the bully was taken aback, wondering how Choi could know the tall guy. Pretending, Choi claimed he had the third eye and could see ghosts, saying that Huck's ghost was standing right behind the bully and had told him everything. Surprisingly, Choi's fabricated ghost story scared the bully to the point of wetting his pants. By the day of release, the bully was still a nervous wreck, haunted by the thought of Huck's vengeful spirit. Before leaving, Choi playfully threw a bottle of strawberry milk at him, another blow to his already frazzled nerves. The school bully was probably on the verge of a breakdown. Stepping out of the prison gates, the scenes of inmates reuniting with their families were touching. Waiting for Choi was his lawyer, declaring his intent to live a good life. Choi renounced the one billion reward, assuring the lawyer he wouldn't expose the tycoon. The lawyer was baffled, wondering if prison had made Choi lose his wits. But Choi was anything but foolish. Compared to the 10 billion treasure, 1 billion was far from enough to satisfy him. The first thing Choi did after getting out was to locate the money hidden by the hitman in a beachside cabin. He discovered not only the substantial sum, but also came across a bag of diamonds, each valued in billions. However, Choi quickly understood that as a newly released convict, lavish purchases would attract suspicion and depositing the money was also risky. Unable to devise a good plan immediately, he decided to sleep on it and figure it out after waking up. In his dreams, Choi saw his mother again, tormented by the regret of a phone call that never connected before his tragic leap. Upon waking, Choi formulated a new plan for the fortune in his possession, half for his biological mother and the other half for Sang's mother. After stashing the 10 billion in a mall locker, Choi took the remaining half and made his way to Sang's home. As he walked through a deserted alley, a man shouted from behind. Before Choi could react, the stranger stabbed him in the stomach. The man attempted to stab him again. But in a critical moment, Choi grabbed his hand and wrestled him to the ground. The attacker revealed he had waited two years to kill Sang, shocked that he was not remembered. It turned out that this man's daughter had been killed in an accident caused by the tycoon. Recalling the trial, Choi remembered the man's fervent accusations of the law's injustice. His daughter's life was lost and the minor responsible got only a two-year sentence. Facing the desperate father, Choi first apologized, then revealed that he was not the true culprit but a scapegoat taking somebody's fall. The man desired the truth, but at that moment, hurried footsteps approached. Fearing discovery, the man fled. The newcomer was Sang's fellow cellmate who anxiously asked if Sang was going to survive. Relieved that the injuries weren't fatal, 
The cellmate's demeanor suddenly shifted to one of menace as he coldly stated that he was worried someone else got to him first because Sang had to die by his own hand. To Troy's astonishment, the cellmate was aligned with the gang in the workshop. It's then revealed that his return with the shovel at that time was up to save Sang, but to join the others in taking him down only to find that Sang had already dealt with him. Troy initially believed that his cellmate had genuinely changed. However, the truth was that his remorse was not for his wrongdoings, but for the mistakes he had made. Now the cellmate was proud of his flawless crime. Upon discovering this, Troy pleaded for his life, promising to pay any sum of money for his safety. But when Troy reached into his bag, the cellmate was skeptical, suspecting a ruse. Convinced that murdering Sang would earn him a reward of 100 million, he struck Sang several more times in critical areas before disappearing without a trace. Suddenly, the phone rang. It was a call from Sang's mother. Despite his best efforts, Troy was unable to answer the call. Tearfully, he returned to the purgatory transit, feeling extremely insecure without his money. He implored the Grim Reaper to proceed, and thus, Choi's sixth reincarnation began. If you're one of the heroes who follow me, let me know by putting this emoji in a comment. I hope today's video is to your liking. Make sure to subscribe to catch the rest of the series.